Molly collapsed. Really? Is she okay? I don't know. The teacher at school said she just passed out during swim class. My daughter Molly caused hyperventilation during swimming class at school and was taken to the hospital. When I arrived at the hospital, Molly was sleeping peacefully. Seeing her sleeping face, I heaved a sigh of relief. Sarah, how's Molly? Is she okay? My husband, John, also rushed over after hearing the news. She's just sleeping calmly now. You can relax, the doctor responded, though his expression was somber for some reason. Doctor, please tell me everything. As I pressed the doctor, almost scolding him, he seemed to make up his mind and ask, how is your daughter's relationship with her grandparents? Why do you ask such a question? I am inquiring about how well your daughter gets along with her grandparents, the doctor asked me again. I was at a loss to answer the unexpected question. Hey, doctor, stop insulting my father and mother any further. John said, shaking with anger. John had veins bulging on his forehead, and I could feel his rage. What's wrong with you? I was surprised by my husband's emotional display, as he usually doesn't show his feelings. Then I will tell you. And then, as a mother, I was struck by the devastating truth that came from the doctor's mouth. My name is Sarah Wilson, a 42-year-old office worker. I currently live with my office worker husband, our elementary school-aged daughter, and my in-laws, making it five of us in total. We originally lived separately from my in-laws. However, my job paid well, but during busy seasons, I would come home late at night John, being in a management position, often prioritized work as well. John's parents were very focused on education, so even after joining the company, John was work-oriented, always aiming for greater heights. He was such a workaholic that he would continue working at home after he got home. As a result, both John and I often made our daughter Molly feel lonely. We have a good income, but I feel sorry for Molly because this makes her feel lonely. I said with a sigh during a discussion with him. Then John made a suggestion. If you're okay with it, Sarah, why don't we live with my parents? Actually, they have been suggesting this for a while. John's father, Michael, was an elite employee who worked for a major trading company for many years. John's mother, Elizabeth, was an educator who taught at a prestigious middle school until she gave birth to John. However, Michael had to take early retirement a few years ago due to worsening chronic illness my mill supported the family as a stay-at-home mother after she quit her teaching job, but she started working part-time when my Phil retired. My husband and I had been sending a fixed amount of money to his parents every month. I've also been thinking about renovating the family home to make it duplex style. I think it's a good opportunity. Yeah, I think living in a house with a yard would be better for Molly than our current apartment. Molly's school would be better surrounded by nature than the urban area. We would discuss this every night after Molly had gone to bed and then report our decision to my mill over the phone. We've come to this conclusion. What do you think, Elizabeth? We would welcome that. In fact, we were hoping to suggest living together. Hearing this from you made me happy and relieved. 
Thus, our plans for living together smoothly progressed. We renovated the in-laws' house, allocating the first floor for them and the second floor for our family's living space. We didn't install locked doors between the spaces so we could always access each other's areas when needed, but we basically respected each other's privacy. I also thought that, since my husband and I often came home late from work, Molly wouldn't feel lonely anymore as she could have dinner with her grandparents on the first floor. But every morning when I leave for work, I can't help but feel guilty towards my in-laws. Thank you so much for taking care of Molly all the time. While John and I are at work, the in-laws always help Molly with her homework. No problem. That's right, Sarah. Molly is our dear granddaughter. Don't worry about it. Michael said with a hearty laugh. Molly, make sure you listen to Grandma and be a good girl. Yes, I see. Then I'm off. Thank you in advance. Having the in-laws as allies made me feel more capable of facing work than ever before. Three months have passed since we started living together. That day, I finished work early and got home sooner than usual, and Molly ran up to me crying and hugged me tightly. What's wrong, Molly? Why are you crying? Molly clung to me and wouldn't look up. Elizabeth followed her and said, It seems Molly is just so happy to see her mom, as she tried to stroke Molly's head. Molly shook her head vehemently, showing her displeasure. Elizabeth smiled sadly. Molly, that's not okay. Grandma always helps you with your homework. It's sad for Grandma if you act like this. She's probably just at an age where she wants to be spoiled by her parents, so right, Molly? I am sorry for making you feel bad. It's all right, I don't mind. Elizabeth said, still smiling gently. Molly was doing her best with her studies until just now. She's a smart girl. When Elizabeth tried to pat Molly on the head, Molly fiercely shook her head, showing her refusal. Molly, mommy will get angry. Say sorry to grandma. When I scolded her, Molly reluctantly turned to Elizabeth and said in a trembling voice, Sorry, Grandma. Molly usually seemed very attached to her grandparents, so at that moment, I didn't think much of it, assuming she just didn't want to study because she wanted to play. It's me who should say sorry, Molly. I thought I saw tears in Elizabeth's eyes. But realizing I was watching, she quickly covered it by laughing and saying, something got in my eye. As time went by, I realized that not only Elizabeth's behavior, but also Molly's was unusual. Molly often played alone even before living with her grandparents, but she had never clung to me and cried like that before. And yet, she showed such an attitude towards her kind grandmother, who always doted on her. Maybe Molly was experiencing troubles that we adults couldn't understand. As bedtime approached, I discussed it with John. If I cut back on work, I could spend more time with Molly. She might not feel so lonely. What are you saying now? We've discussed this many times and decided. My parents are taking care of Molly, so there's no need to worry. I know that, but even if your parents are good people, they can't replace Molly's mother. Are you saying my parents aren't good enough? John frowned and glared at me. John often gave me that look when he didn't like something. 
I'm not saying that. It's just. Anyway, we should just leave Molly's care to my parents. He insisted, turning his back to me as if to end the conversation, and fell asleep. Winter came, and my busy work schedule finally entered a slow period. I'll do the dishes, you rest. Oh, really? Aren't you tired from work? It's relatively slow at work now, so I can do laundry and cleaning on my days off. Is that so? Well, I'll take your word for it and watch TV. I decided to dedicate myself to the household chores, making up for the time I couldn't contribute before. John remained busy with his work as usual. Sarah is really putting in the effort. Well then, leave Molly's shower to me. Are you sure? You must be tired. I responded, thinking he was being considerate due to my bustling around the house. Leave it to me. Parent-child communication is important, after all. He said, puffing out his chest. Molly, go ahead and take a shower with Daddy. I called out to her, and she took John's hand and headed to the bathroom. Imagining the delightful scene of father and daughter together, I couldn't help but smile. However, when Molly came out of the shower, I was startled. Molly, your face is really red, isn't it? Her face seemed unusually flushed. Molly just looked up at John and kept her mouth shut, not saying anything. What's wrong, Molly? Why are you so quiet? Maybe she stayed under the shower too long and got overheated. She must be feeling a bit woozy. John responded for her. Are you really okay? I asked her repeatedly, concerned, but each time Molly would glance at John and nod, saying, Yay, I'm fine. From that day on, Despite being busy with work, John took it upon himself to give Molly her daily shower. However, Molly's face appeared red after each bath. Could Molly be sick? Maybe we should have her seen a doctor. You're overreacting, Molly. You're okay, right? Nothing hurts? Yeah, I'm fine. See, Sarah? You worry too much about Molly? John said, dismissing my concerns with a laugh. At that time, I was still unaware of my daughter's suffering. Time passed, and the following summer arrived. Swimming classes started at Molly's elementary school. Molly had always loved playing in the water since she was young, and she looked forward to the swimming classes every year. That's great, Molly. Your favorite swimming classes start today. Yeah, that's right. Are you sure you remember how to swim after a year? Yeah, probably. For some reason, Molly looked downcast that morning. Even though she had been eagerly anticipating the summer, she didn't smile once that morning. I thought she might be a bit nervous about going back to the pool after a long time, but looking at her face, it seemed more like fear than nervousness. Molly, are you okay? I'm okay, Mom. Don't worry about me. Molly said, forcing a strained smile. Are you sure you're not pushing yourself? If you're feeling unwell, I can call the school, and you can stay home. I'm fine, so you go to work, Mom. Okay, Molly. I'm going to work now. Bye. See you later, Mom. Molly smiled and saw me off. But her smile still seemed forced. Molly will be okay. Grandma and Grandpa are there if anything happens. 
I reassured myself and focused on my work. Returning to the office after lunch break, I received alarming news. Sarah, it's urgent. Your daughter's school called, saying she fainted during swim class and has been taken to the hospital. My colleagues said in a panic. What, Molly? You should go now. I was so upset that I couldn't move for a moment, but my boss urged me to come back to myself, so I picked up a taxi and hurried to the hospital. On the way, I contacted my husband. Molly collapsed. Is it true? Is she okay? I don't know. The teacher said she just fainted all of a sudden during the swimming lesson. What is the school doing? If something had happened, they would have had to take responsibility later. Now's not the time for that. I'm on my way to the hospital where Molly was taken. Okay, I'm heading there now too. My usually work-focused husband seemed genuinely flustered this time. When I arrived at the hospital, Molly was peacefully sleeping in her bed. Seeing her sleeping face, I felt a wave of relief. I'm so glad Molly is safe. The tension I had been carrying broke, and I felt dizzy. Are you all right? Supported by the doctor nearby, I managed not to collapse. Sarah, is Molly okay? John, Molly is. I tried to answer, but my words tangled. She's just sleeping calmly now. Please don't worry, the doctor calmly responded. Doctor, thank you so much. I lowered my head to the doctor tears of relief falling. However, the doctor's expression remained serious and somber. Doctor, is there something wrong? Well, actually. The doctor seemed hesitant to respond. Doctor, please tell me everything. I was seized with fear that perhaps a serious illness had been found in Molly. Well, how is your daughter's relationship with her grandparents on a daily basis? The doctor asked carefully. What do you mean by that? I couldn't immediately grasp the intention behind the doctor's roundabout questioning. I'm asking if your daughter's relationship with her grandparents is going well. Yes, it is. But why are you asking this? I understood the question, but was puzzled as to why the doctor would want to know this. An inexplicable fear was growing in me about what could happen between Molly and her grandparents. As I struggled to respond and fell silent, John behind me said, shaking with anger, Hey, doctor, what are you trying to say? I could see the anger rising in him veins standing out on his forehead. What's wrong with you? Feeling something was seriously off with John, who rarely showed his emotions, I became even more concerned. Stop insulting my parents. I'm not trying to insult them. I just want to confirm the facts. I tried to clarify. John, becoming furious, seemed ready to confront the doctor physically, but the doctor remained calm and tried to soothe him. My parents care about Molly. Stop making baseless accusations. If you insult my parents further, I will sue you. Calm down a bit. How can I stay calm? My parents are being insulted. Why do you ask such a question? The doctor sighed deeply, as if troubled. Well, I'll tell you. The doctor then recounted the circumstances when Molly was brought to the hospital. When Molly was about to enter the pool for swimming class, she hyperventilated 
and was brought in by ambulance, which are already new from the school's explanation. However, the concern arose afterward. When Molly arrived at the hospital, she seemed to be desperately trying to plead something even in her troubled breathing. As the doctor was attending to her, he leaned in to listen to her murmurs and heard her repeatedly apologizing, saying, sorry, grandma, sorry, grandpa, as if she was in a daze. The fact that she repeatedly apologized to her grandparents in such a distressing situation suggests that there must have been a significant experience. What exactly happened between your daughter and her grandparents? This question took me by surprise, as it was completely unexpected. Doctor, I don't understand what you're talking about. I said, but my gaze shifted from the doctor to my husband, who seemed even more agitated. What's with it, love? You. You know something, don't you? I confronted him, sensing his strange behavior indicated he was hiding something. I don't know anything. This doctor is talking nonsense. It's impossible that my parents would do something terrible to Molly. John, who had been angry, suddenly started laughing, as if trying to cover up something that shouldn't be revealed. What I have mentioned is not nonsense. I am merely stating the facts. Furthermore, I have not said that your parents have done something terrible to your daughter. I understand now. In that case, I will be clear. I suspect that her grandparents may have been causing her distress on a regular basis. Therefore, we have already contacted Child Protective Services. You can't just do whatever you want. In cases of suspicion, it is my duty as a doctor to promptly contact the relevant authorities. The doctor argued back. Perhaps our loud conversation woke Molly as she opened her eyes. Mom. Molly, you're awake. Thank goodness. I rushed to her and hugged her tightly as she sat up. You can take her home today, the doctor said, to which John responded, of course. How can we leave her with such a reckless doctor? Let's go, Molly. He then grabbed our daughter's hand trying to make her walk forcefully. Don't touch her. Instinctively, I pulled Molly's hand away from John before even thinking. Tension filled the air between John and me, but my concern was more for Molly's well-being. In the taxi ride home, John continued to rant. That doctor is all lies. He just wants to make my parents look bad. I couldn't take John's words seriously and remained silent. What? You doubt my parents too? It's not that, but... Molly, have you been abused by Grandma and Grandpa? Yeah, no, I haven't. See, Molly says she hasn't been mistreated. That doctor was just spouting nonsense. Molly's response seemed forced clearly under the pressure of John's dominating demeanor, seeing Molly's frightened expression. I speculated about what could have happened between her and her grandparents. Something horrendously frightening must have occurred to Molly, something she felt she couldn't even tell me about. The fact that the doctor felt the need to contact Child Protective Services indicated a serious concern. But when I questioned my in-laws about it, I knew that if they said they didn't know, that would be the end of it. There is no evidence that they were harassing my daughter. Hey, are you even listening? John's voice snapped me back to reality. Sorry, did you say something? I've told you before. Don't let anyone from Child Protective Services inside if they come asking around. 
Why? If we have nothing to hide, we should let them in and prove that everything is fine. I countered him, even though I knew it was useless. What if it starts rumors around the neighborhood? It could affect my career. Think before you speak. John had always walked the path of an elite, never facing failure from childhood through his professional life. His high pride feared bad reputation more than anything, making me wonder if his pride was more important than our daughter Molly's well-being. Should he protect his pride more than his daughter? As I thought about this, my eyes fell on the taxi's dash cam. That's right, that could be useful. I remembered a crucial fact I hadn't shared with John or the in-laws. The next day, I pretended everything was normal, submitted a leave request at work. And after killing time at a friend's house, I waited for Molly at her school's gate when it was time for her to get out. Molly, come here. Seeing me, Molly looked surprised but also visibly relieved. Mom, what's happening? I'll explain later. We're going to take a plane. We then took a bus to the airport and flew to my hometown where my parents lived. From that night into the early morning, John called repeatedly. Feeling frustrated by the repeated calls, I decided to accept the call. What have you done? Where did you take Molly? She's in a safe place, out of your reach. What? Don't be ridiculous. Just come back and explain everything to me properly? We're not coming back. An explanation over the phone will suffice. Then at least send Molly back to us. John yelled over the phone. I steadfastly declined. I refuse. Why? What have we ever done to you? If you don't remember, let me enlighten you. It's because you and your parents have been making Molly do things she despises every day. The anger I had suppressed in me exploded. I explained the process of getting here to John step by step. On the way back from the hospital, I remembered while looking at the taxi's dash cam that I had installed a camera in the living room of the first floor. Unusual occurred. It was set up to monitor the elderly in-laws and Molly, alerting my smartphone immediately if anything unusual occurred. The first floor, where the in-laws lived, allowed Molly free access when John and I were not around. Shortly after we started living as a joint family, Elizabeth began forcing Molly to wash dishes and do cleaning tasks. Initially, I thought it was just Elizabeth's way of teaching her granddaughter household chores, but Elizabeth never instructed her. She just watched Molly with Michael. Molly complied without complaints, completing the tasks as told. However, when Molly was about to go back upstairs after finishing, Elizabeth called her back saying in a sorrowful voice, Next, please clean the bathroom. Thank you. But I have homework. I'm sorry, but please do as you're told. If you can't, we can't let you live here. Please do as you're told for your own good. With that, Elizabeth grabbed Molly's wrist, seemingly trying to force her outside against her will. Do as you're told, Molly. Elizabeth's voice was clear on the surveillance camera, which captured sound well despite slight static. Elizabeth sounded sorrowful even as she commanded. Grandpa, help me. Molly pleaded for help from her grandfather, Michael, who did nothing to reprimand Elizabeth, 
and merely watched silently. Faced with this unbelievable reality unfolding in the video, I was speechless. The harassment from the grandparents towards Molly appeared to continue daily when I was not at home. I couldn't believe that the grandparents were doing such things behind my back. I kept the surveillance camera a secret but shared with John the harassment Molly faced from his parents. Misinterpreting something, John angrily retorted, Molly, after all the discipline, she still talked, wasn't it enough? So you started everything, didn't you? What are you talking about? I mentioned your parents' actions, but I never said you were involved. You tricked me. That's despicable. Despicable? Who's the one who's been doing terrible things to our elementary school daughter? I remembered the days when John insisted on giving Molly showers. I know what you were doing during Molly's shower. I didn't have solid proof, but decided to confront him. It's education. She didn't want to study anymore, and she seemed satisfied with her A score on the test. So I just thought I'd give her a little re-education. Re-education. How can you even say that? Molly is terrified. I only told Molly she couldn't get out of the shower until she correctly answered my questions. John confessed his mistake. You were mad when the doctor at the hospital asked about Molly's relationship with her grandparents, weren't you? but that wasn't to protect your parents. You were afraid of being caught forcing your unwilling parents to do it. That's also why you refused to let Child Protective Services intervene. The surveillance footage clearly recorded John threatening his parents. The in-laws weren't willingly making Molly do things she disliked. Molly's face was always reddened because John wouldn't let her out of the shower for a long time. The shower experience became traumatic for Molly, turning water into her fear. Then, on the day there was swimming class at school, Molly was traumatized again the moment she tried to enter the pool, triggering a panic attack. It's your fault she can no longer enjoy the pool she loves. So what? You don't understand my feelings. I don't want to know about it. My father was a top executive, and my mother was a renowned educator locally. But I was always scorned if my grades dropped even slightly as a child. I don't want to feel that miserable ever again. That's why I was strict with Molly to spare her from going through what I did. That's what I believe parental discipline was. With those words, John began to laugh with a sinister tone. I felt victorious inside when my father had to retire due to his chronic illness and came to me for financial help. I turned the tables on them. I told my parents I'd support them financially, but in return, they had to discipline Molly strictly that was the condition under which I agreed to live with them. I was horrified to find out John's twisted true feelings. I recorded this phone call. And that's not all. The surveillance camera has also recorded how you threatened your parents, both their actions and voices. I will use this evidence to protect her. You are finished. Hey, wait a minute. We can talk this through. John was panicking at the end, but I had nothing more to say and hung up the phone, then blocked his number. I went to the police and child services with footage from the surveillance camera, the recording of the call, and the medical report I got from the hospital. This is terrible. The video and the audio are clear evidence. The responding police officer promised to deal with the incident immediately. Later, 
I was shocked by the new facts that I learned from Molly. When I asked her why she didn't confide in me sooner, Molly, in tears, said, Because Dad threatened that if I didn't do it right, he would put busy Mom through the same ordeal. I don't want Mom to get hurt. John, her biological father, had been threatening her all this time. And to protect me, she had been keeping her fear and anxiety to herself, even though she was just a child. She was trying to protect me, her mother, even though she should have been the hardest. I hadn't noticed the pain my daughter was going through. Am I even a mother? Ashamed of myself, I hugged my sobbing daughter tightly. I'm sorry, Molly. It was all my fault. It's not your fault, Mom. Because you saved me. Feeling her warmth, I couldn't stop my tears. Of course, I'm on your side, Molly. No matter what happens, I won't leave you alone. I love you so much, and I will always protect you. I vowed in my heart never to let her experience sadness again. Ultimately, the medical report and the recorded phone calls were decisive, and John was arrested for criminal injury. However, the in-laws were granted extenuating circumstances. Some time passed after that incident. The gaunt faces of my in-laws, Michael and Elizabeth, showed up at my parents' house. I'm so sorry, Sarah and Molly. It's too late for us to apologize now, but... We are truly sorry. We knew it was wrong, but we just couldn't refuse his demands. We are such terrible grandparents. Please, lift your heads, Michael, Elizabeth. From the videos, it's clear you were coerced by John into mistreating Molly. To be honest, I felt like blaming my in-laws. But blaming them wouldn't change anything. Michael apologized deeply, perhaps because he understood my feelings. He had a chronic illness that should have hurt his legs, but he stood upright with his face contorted. Even though we were threatened, the fact that we did something terrible to our dear granddaughter is true. We don't expect forgiveness, but we just wanted to apologize to Sarah and Molly. Maybe, in the end, we just wanted to ease our own feelings. Molly ran over and gently patted the backs of Michael and Elizabeth. Grandpa and Grandma, I'm not mad at you. Thank you for teaching my homework. Molly's words broke them down, and they didn't look up. It seems to say that they have no right to show their faces to their granddaughter. Molly told them they could come to see her any time, but after that, my in-laws never appeared before us again. Five years have passed since then, and Molly has become a middle school student. Currently, Molly and I now live with my parents. I explained the situation to my company, and they allowed me to switch to primarily remote work. Although the local police are ready to respond if John shows up, I still can't shake off my anxiety. I've attended security seminars and bought security gadgets to strengthen the security at home. I make sure to drop off and pick up Molly from school to protect her. Molly has slowly started to regain her smile. Recently, she began helping my father with the gardening he started as a hobby after retirement. Grandpa, look at this big potato we harvested. Wow, that's a big one. Molly, how about we make some potato salad with your mom tonight? Okay, we'll do that. Living with Molly, my parents seem to have rejuvenated both in spirit and appearance. 
Just as Molly tried to protect me, I want to protect her with all my might from now on. Watching Molly's carefree smile, I felt this more than ever.